Today, I'm going to be doing a pan pastel and colored pencil demonstration while giving you some tips on how to draw realistic white fur. Before we get into this demonstration, if you are members over on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got the real-time version of this demonstration available for you to follow along with now. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon, for as little as $4 a month, you get access to every single one of my longer lessons. I've got over 200 for you to watch now in multiple mediums. If you're not sure if Patreon is going to be a fit for you, head over to my website where I've got a video library. You can check out what's available and watch a free colored pencil demonstration. The links are in the video description. For this demonstration, I am working on the Lux Archival Sanded Paper from brushandpencil.com. And just for transparency, they did provide me with this paper to test out, and I love it. And it's the only sanded paper I will be using moving forward. It's actually acid-free front and back, unlike UART and Fisher 400, which is what I had previously used. This paper is amazing. Anyway, enough of that, let's move on. So I'm going to go ahead and start with pan pastels in this case, and you can use just colored pencil. You would not have to use pan pastels if you don't have those for the, this project, but it does speed things along. I also wanna point out here, I'm using blue painter's tape to tape my paper down. Don't do that, that's a bad idea. I'm using archival materials. I should keep using archival materials, which I'm not doing in using that tape. I was just out of my black tape and I'm waiting for that. Actually, I think it was delivered yesterday. I should go look, huh? But um, there is a black pH neutral tape, which is a much better way to tape your work to your drawing board. That way, if any residue from the tape ends up on the artwork, you're not gonna have problems with that later on down the line. So this is definitely a do as I say, not as I do thing. So I'm just blending a soft background here. And one of the things that I liked so much about this reference photo, and I got this one over at Pixabay, one of the things that was so great is that the cat colors and the background are pretty much the same. So we're not really separating the cat from super high contrast from that background or a, a big difference in color. This is a difference of texture for the most part. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to notice as we work our way forward. Now what I'm going to do is just block in loosely a base layer here. Now you may think, okay, white cat, use white. The thing is, if I were to just start with white, there's, I can't go lighter from there. You're really not using that much white when you draw white fur. I'm going to get all of my darker values in here first, but notice how many of these colors, they reflect what is in the background. So let's say my background had more violets or magentas. I would use those colors as my base instead of the blues that I'm using here. Whenever I'm drawing white animals, I'm gonna pull whatever those background colors in are into my base. So it's not like every single time I'm gonna use blue and tans and browns. It really depends on what that background is. And look how dark I need to go here so that the white, when I come back through with that later, will really show up. And I can be pretty messy. It's not a big deal if I am not even in the right place. If I go too dark in one area or too light, it's not a huge deal. I just need to block in some of these darks. And these are soft tools that I'm using, S-O-F-F-T tools for applying the pan pastels. I'm gonna add a couple of layers with the pan pastel there, and then I can come back through with my colored pencil and add in details. I'm using, for the most part, my polychromos. Polychromos are, they have a higher wet or oil-based content than most of the other colored pencils I use. And so they blend out a lot better than let's say the Caran d'Ache Luminance, something with a higher wax content. I'm gonna save my higher wax content pencils like the Caran d'Ache Luminance or Derwent Drawing, the Chinese White, I used that a couple of times. I'm going to save those for areas where I really do not want it to blend out, where I just want it to stay put. That higher wax, will it just kind of solidifies it in that area. So like the details around the eyes, I don't want those to smudge out. I want that to be one of few areas in this piece that are really, really sharp. So I'm gonna use my wax-based pencils there. But for the other areas where I'm wanting to blend it out, I'm mostly using my polychromos. I'm also going to use some of my Derwent Lightfast pencils. The Derwent Lightfast are listed as being oil-based. To me, in practice, they feel somewhere like a nice balance in between a traditional oil or traditional wax-based pencil, but they do blend out on this a lot better than a higher wax content pencil like the Caran d'Ache Luminance. The polychromos 
those blend the most. So it really just kind of depends on which effect I'm going for as to which pencil I'm going to choose when using these techniques. So coming through now and adding some of the whites, you can see why it was so important for me to get the darker undertones dark enough so that these white areas would stand out. If I had them too light, you have a tendency when you look at your reference photo to go, okay, that's really light. And you make your base layers really light. You have to factor in that when you put those lighter highlights on top of it, it's going to make the whole appear lighter. So make sure those darks are dark enough in the first place. Now, let's say worst case scenario, you did not go dark enough. It's not the end of the world. It just going to make a little bit more work for you. So don't feel like you've ruined it or you need to start over. You're just going to come back through a bit more with some of your darker values in between the light areas. So it's really just an issue of causing or costing you a bit more time, not ruining the piece. So don't, don't give up if you realize, oh, I didn't go dark enough. Now, as I move the fur areas around, I do blend these out or soften them a bit with my fingers, but I also want to make sure that the fur is still moving in about the right direction. I don't care if each little strand is exact to the reference photo. That does not, that's not a big deal. What I need is for it to be close, going about the right direction, being about the, the brush strokes or pencil strokes in this case, being about the right length. Notice the word about is being used a lot. In this case with fur, we don't need it to be exact. I need the eyes to be in the right place, the nose, the ears. Those I'm going to be more, more picky about. But if the cat shakes its head at all, the hair is all going to shift. If the wind blows, the hair is going to shift. So it's not a huge deal that in that case it be exact. Notice how the fur moves in clumps and clusters. Just put a piece of glassine under my hand so that I won't smudge my work. It keeps the oils from my skin off the work as well. Now, another tip I have for you, when you are drawing really soft fur like this, don't try to force in extra detail. It's easy to want to make all of the pencil strokes really stand out, but now the fur will look kind of wiry or oily, a bit dirty. It, it's rougher. It doesn't have that really soft feel. Look at how along the back of the neck, the top of the head, there's not really any detail. It's just shadows and that's okay to leave. Pay, pay attention to your reference photo where the fur is going to be more clumpy versus where it's just a soft shadow. Don't feel like you have to force detail that isn't there. It almost seems too easy with animals with super soft coats like collies, that really soft, soft fur, real cottony almost. That is going, you, they're easier. You don't have a lot of detail to put in there. Not as much as a, a breed that has a a coarser coat. Coarser, is that even a word? A more coarse? No one's here for grammar. Notice how many times I switch directions on these pencil marks constantly. And I'm coming back through with some darker colors. I use a lot of magenta and put mortem, that's a polychromous color. That is a, those are colors that I use in almost every portrait, whether it be people or pets. And even on people portraits, no matter the skin tone of the person, I'm going to use those colors a lot. And you just keep building. Now, I like to break things up into smaller sections. Don't try to do the whole cat all at once. That like gets very overwhelming and things end up looking rushed and just... That's not cute. I, I would avoid that. You can break it up into smaller sections that you're foc focusing on at a time that's gonna make it way easier to tackle and your work is going to be made way more accurate. I cannot talk, way more accurate because of it. Now you can use OMS, odorless mineral spirits, on top if you wanted to blend or make an area super, super sharp. For me, the only areas, and I didn't need to on this, but if I wanted to make, let's say, the curve around the front of the eye really sharp, I could do that with a small brush and OMS. I didn't find I needed it. I found the wax-based pencils really were enough, but it, it, you can use odorless mineral spirits on sanded paper. And this paper especially handles it really well. You have to be careful though, in this case, if you were to use it over the pan pastels, if that pan pastel is really chalky, you haven't sealed it down a lot. I use a product called Spectrafix. I had a video recently talking about how to avoid getting little droplets. I'll have a card pop up if you wanna check that out. 
but I would seal it down with the Spectra Fix first and then use blend your OM or put your colored pencil down and blend with the OMS if you're going to use it. If you did not put the Spectra Fix down and you use the OMS, you get this weird paste. You don't ruin anything. You can fix it, but you're going to have to fix it. I mean, it's not something you can leave. So it is something you want to be aware of if you are using OMS. Seal the pan pastels down a bit, at least a couple of squirts or layers with the, the Spectra Fix first. Now the whiskers, you're gonna be tempted to put those on earlier because it's like, that just makes the cat look like a cat. It looks so much better. Don't, wait until that's, everything else is pretty much done. Uh, it's what, when I used to teach people and teach classes in person, that was always one of the things everyone wants to do the foreground stuff first. That needs to be last because you need to get all the fur done behind it first. You don't wanna have to be trying to add the fur in in between all of those little whiskers. So save that till the end. I'm coming back through and defining some of the darker bits a bit more. And as always, the color is not what you want to worry about or, or be super hyper focused on. That the color's not that big of a deal. The thing that is going to make a difference in your work are your values. Are your darks dark enough? Your lights light enough? So let's say you used more purples and violets. It's still going to look like a realistic cat. It's not about finding the perfect blue, the perfect anything like that. That isn't what makes a difference in your work looking realistic. Paying attention to your values, paying attention to your details. In this case, how the fur clumps and clusters together. These are the things that are going to make it look more realistic, not finding the perfect color. And I bring that up all the time because it seems to be something that hangs up most beginner artists. They just, they feel like if they just knew what color to use, their work would look more realistic. No, it really has very little to do with it. Just soften some of this out here. And there we go. There is our finished drawing. Hope these tips helped you. If you have any tips for drawing white fur, please let us know in the comments. I don't think I've introduced you guys to my husband's Indian ring neck. This is Sushi. He's been with us for a few months. He has destroyed he, the paper on the top of his cage. He shreds that daily. That has to be changed out every day and he shreds it every day. Seriously, Sushi, what have you done? That was just like organized and cleaned just an hour ago. It was all perfect. Look what you did. Yes, you did this. This, this is your mess. Sushi has not yet started talking. He's still a baby. We don't actually know for certain that it's a male. We didn't have not done a DNA test yet. We also could just wait until he's about 15 to 18 months old to see if the ring develops around his neck. Stop eating my phone. That is not for biting. Sushi is a pretty noisy guy. I should probably get some video of him sounding like a crazy monkey because that's what he sounds like in the other room. He actually sets off the glass break sensors on our alarm system really loud. There, have a crackberry. He's super addicted to these. The majority of his diet are fresh fruits and vegetables in this kind of, I call it chicken mash. It's not actually chicken, um, but it's for our shoulder chickens. That's what his, the majority of his diet is, but he gets the nutriberries or crackberries as we call them as a sort of treat. He's quite obsessed. And if he drops them or if he decides he wants one, he'll just scream and sound like a crazy monkey setting off glass break sensors in the other room. He's pretty funny. My husband is quite in love with him. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy work button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos and pet updates every single week. You may also want to click on the bell notification icon guy and change the settings there because YouTube really doesn't notify people anymore when new videos go up.